of Economic Policy and Sustainable Development at the African Union Commission. Thank you for joining us so early in the morning after a completely entertaining night last night for those who attended the state dinner. And a very happy Africa Day to you all. We are here to discuss a theme that is pertinent to the future of this continent. Key actions to drive inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. The literature is abound with evidence that to achieve and maintain a high income status, a country's GDP growth should be higher than its country's population growth over a long period of time and typically several decades. The African Union Commission's Department of Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry and Minerals, in collaboration with AUDA NEPAD and the African Development Bank, is embarking on a groundbreaking study to address this important topic. You may ask, what is different? How are we going to achieve uh, this vision? We have the African Development Bank's high fives. We have uh, Africa's Agenda 2063. And we have the UN uh, Agenda 2030. And multiple other studies and strategies have been undertaken. So what is different? We have a distinguished panel, and they are going to respond to these questions and more. But first, uh, let me welcome His Excellency Ambassador Albert Muchanga, Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry, and Minerals at the African Union Commission to give his opening remarks. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Director of Ceremony. And to each and every one of you, happy Africa Day. It's a very great day for Africa. We remember where we came from. We evaluate what we have achieved since 1963. And then we look forward to a better future. And it's very, 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 very uh, important that uh, the meeting that we are having today, this breakfast meeting, is happening in Africa Freedom Day. We have the political independence. Where is the economic independence? And the measurements are there. Africa is the youngest population, has the youngest population in the world, median age of 19 years. But the patterns of economic growth have yielded sustained levels of poverty. Because the rates of economic growth are not enough to contribute to poverty reduction. And as we commemorate Africa Freedom Day, the agenda before us, what can we do differently to ensure that we place Africa on a path of sustained inclusive economic growth and sustainable development. At one time, I brought up this discussion with a friend of mine. He has a PhD in economics. And he said, it's impossible. Africa cannot come out of her status. It's impossible. If you do it, let me see it. But it's impossible. My belief is that uh, there is nothing impossible in life. If you strive with tenacity, if there is a passion to make a difference, you can do it. And the fundamentals were laid out in the African Union Agenda 2063. 
One of the aspirations is to have a, a prosperous Africa anchored on inclusive economic growth and sustainable development. And one of the program objectives is that beginning 2023, which is next year, Africa must start growing at a rate of 7% per annum. So how do we translate these aspirations and program of, uh, uh, objectives into concrete action? And hence the decision to partner with Auda Nepad, the African Development Bank, and ourselves to come up with a study which is going to be unveiled to you by the chief economist, my brother, Kevin Orama. The two teams worked, the three teams actually, including Auda Nepad, worked on coming up with a draft concept paper which has been approved. And hence, we are ready to go into the actual study itself. And in going forward, a number of issues are at play. One of which is to align the high fives, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and the African Union Agenda 2063. We had a meeting a few days ago with the, my brother from ECA. And he said he looked forward to a day when we would have a joint meeting of ministers responsible for finance, economic planning, and integration, bringing together all at once the African Development Bank, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and the African Union Commission. But the, the politics is such that these days we have separate meetings, which really eats on the term of our policymakers. But with the program activities, we are going to start the process of aligning these three initiatives. That's the first issue. The next issue is that uh, is a document to be used by member states on a daily basis. We expect them to domesticate it, and we are going to ensure that they domesticate it. One of the early initiatives that we are going to embark on, immediately the document is adopted by the African Union Heads of State and Government within a year is to request one of them to come up to be the champion for Africa's inclusive growth and sustainable development. And in that role, he or she is going to demand from the peers annual reports on how they are doing to implement the agenda that we're going to develop as a result of the study. And as will be indicated by my brother, Kevin, there are very, very good graphs on the 54 African countries that are member states of the African Development Group, showing patterns of GNP per capita growth from 1960 to the year 2020. And the picture is not very, very encouraging. And we want to use that as the baseline. Each country will say, how are you doing relative to the baseline? And we request the support of the governors of the African Development uh, Bank. Uh, through many issues, such as facilitating its domestication at the national level, as well as uh, uh, its financing. And we deliberately said 
the governors this time should be in the group of panelists. We presented the, the idea to another panel discussion almost about 20 days ago, and it was very, very well received. So we would like your inputs. Be frank. If there are shortcomings, tell us, because that is going to uh, improve us, our performance. So these are my opening remarks, and I will yield the floor to the director of ceremony. And once again, happy Africa Freedom Day. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. You heard that nothing is impossible. And to give the keynote presentation on how we are going to achieve inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa, may I now call upon mm -hmm. Professor Kevin Chika Urama. Professor, you have 30 minutes to uh, deliver your presentation. Yes, I <laughs> wanted to check. Please, breakfast is served. <laughs> Good morning, Your Excellencies, um, our dear governors, distinguished guests, our executive directors, ladies and gentlemen. I think the first thing is let's feed Africa first as we talk about how to take Africa to new levels, we need to sustain ourselves now. As the president of the bank always says, we have to take two tablets after food. So let's eat the food first as we continue to listen to this. And first, let me, on behalf of the president of the African Development Bank, thank you very much for making our time to be with us uh, this early morning. We've had busy days since the annual meeting started, and your being here is a very clear indication of your dedication for a brighter Africa, the Africa we want. So this uh, presentation, as already uh, uh, explained by my brother, His Excellency Albert Muchanga, is on how to drive inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. Next slide, please. So we are going to uh, look at introductions, please. Next slide. So we'll look, uh, just basically have a, some introductions in terms of Africa's commitment to inclusive and sustainable development. Africa, just like many parts of the world, we are very good in making policy commitments. But when it comes to implementing those policies, we find, sometimes find challenges. And then we try to look at the historic growth performance of African countries, each one of them, and African regions, and Africa as a continent within the context of global growth, uh, at least from the period when most African countries got independence, since 1960. Our purpose of doing this is to try and find a trajectory, where is Africa going, find the gaps, what has been the challenges that Africa has faced, and find the successes that we may need to replicate in order to achieve inclusive growth in Africa. So from there, we talk about the challenges and opportunities, proposed actions that we can take as part of this study and draw some conclusions as we go forward. Next slide. As already mentioned by colleagues, we have several action plans and agendas and policies already agreed to in Africa. The Agenda 2063, to build the Africa we want. The global, uh, uh, DG8, um, the, uh, the goal eight of the SDGs in terms of prov promoting sustainable and inclusive uh, uh, growth. And also the AF AFDB's high fives, which sets some framework for infrastructure investments in order to achieve these two goals that I've talked about before. But we have all these goals, but we know from economic history that to achieve sustained inclusive growth, we need a GDP growth, annual GDP growth of more than 7% annually over several decades. 
three to four decades, if you look at economic growth in all regions that has been able to reach that level, they did not just grow and fall, rise and fall. We keep hearing Africa rising, and I always joke and say, you can only rise when you had fallen. So but some people remain cruising. So how do we bring Africa to that level where we can have more than 7% growth annually for more than three, four decades so that we can have structural transformation that allows growth and development to happen. So when we are doing this, we also try to consider the improvements in inequality. So some of these factors that create fragilities in the continent, poverty, structural transformation, and diversification of our economies. Some of these issues are songs you sing in every economic conference. You need to diversify economy. You need to uh, reduce uh, poverty. You need to create jobs. You need to be inclusive. So the difference in these studies, we're trying to ask clear questions in terms of how do we do it? What have we been doing right that we need to replicate? What have we been doing wrongly that we need to change? And what lessons can we learn from our peers other continents and other countries in the world that has been able to achieve what we want to achieve. Next slide. On this slide, I show two graphs. One you will see when we present the African Economic Outlook, and I made it minuscule on top, is a short-term view of Africa's growth. And if you look at it, you will say we are doing very well. We are supposed to be achieving 7%. This year, uh, 2021, Africa's growth is estimated at 6.9%. So we say we are nearly there. But when you look at the other uh, graph that is below there, that tracks Africa's growth since 1960, you see a cobweb. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. So it depends on which part of the Africa's history you are in. You will either say that Africa is in high growth contraction and recession, or that Africa is growing fast. If you disaggregate this by countries and by regions on the continent, then you start finding that some countries have been able to grow sustainably for more than like two decades, and something happens and they crash. And then the question is, why are we having these failed takeoffs? There are lots of statistics on the graph, which I'm not going to present since this is a, uh, an informal breakfast meeting. But then maybe when you get the uh, PowerPoint, you can look at it yourself. If you track this, you find that there was a period when Africa was actually really rising, maintaining about 5% of growth annually on average across the continent. So it was just like two percentage points short of what we require to start achieving structural transformation. But like I have said, it's always quick takeoffs and sometimes crash landing. So what's happening? Why is this continuing to happen on the continent? And how can we break that and do things differently? Next slide, please. On this next slide, you will see the cumulative effect of these high growth, low growth, and continued failed takeoffs we have on the continent. So here I have the growth figures for major regions of the world, if you are able to see the slides. And you find there's three, uh, four of them, three of them on top, where you see the advanced economies, they take off and continue to fly. And then you see that Africa really has never taken off. If you look at that graph there, Africa is almost at the x-axis from 1960 to date. And then I started wondering, what's going on? But we haven't seen high growth, low growth. Why is it that we, as Africa together, is really not making much move in terms of benefiting from the current global architecture? Next slide, please. And you start finding several issues. Trade is always an engine for growth everywhere. My brother here, VP Solomon, will tell you the importance of trade and private sector for growth in every continent and every region. But in Africa, intra-Africa uh, regional, intra-regional trade, which is us trading with each other, is very low. At the time we did this, it was 15%. Now it's going up a little bit to around 17%, but that is still too low 
compared to different regions that has been able to break that vicious circle of poverty that we're talking about. We have 67% in Europe, 47% in South America, 61% in Asia, and so on and so forth. So why is it that ours is very low um, we, uh, uh, in, in this regard? So that's already one thing that I think we need to put our hand, finger on as we go forward if we want to achieve inclusive and sustainable development on the continent, improving intra-regional trade. We now hearing cases of French sharing, reshoring, and all those things that is coming up because of the geopolitical tensions we're having in Russia and uh, by, uh, because of the war, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. And each time you'll find that whenever there's a crisis, people normally would do French sharing and reshoring. But in every statistic you track in Africa, whether it be in international collaboration on publications, on trade, on patents, on technology, you see lines going from Africa to the rest of the world and not lines going from Africa within each other. So if we continue like that, we may not be able to achieve the Agenda 2063 dream that we all have. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. On this slide, we try to bring this storyline that I'm telling you in a picture. So there, we tracked the growth of African countries by decades. And if you look at it, you'll find that during the first um, uh, early decades, Africa was doing a little bit better, but different countries in Africa succeed in growing two decades high growth, third decade, they go, to, they go into recession. So we like to follow those countries to see what happened that you took up so fast, some of them growing at 29.4% 20, uh, percentage growth annually for some period. So what happened? Is there an external factor? Is there an internal factor? What are those things that are creating these sharp falls or plain crashes, if I call it, in our growth system? And some countries have also not uh, even grown, uh, have decelerated if you consider their growth in the early 1960s and now. Again, I'm not going to go into too much of the statistics because of time. But if you look at the next slide, please. If you look at the next slide, this is the, the picture that my brother was referring to. In order to try and understand why it is that we still have, we have some countries who are celebrating that are doing very well in Africa, and on some periods that we celebrate that Africa is doing very well, but then if you take, it, take us in aggregate and look at the growth trajectory since 1960, we see a straight line that is almost flat. So what's going on? So we looked at the different countries for the same periods. And what you find that individual countries have experienced different growth paths, leaving us lessons to learn internally in terms of how to change Africa's growth trajectory. We have countries like Botswana, Burkina Faso, Cape Verde, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia that have recorded extended growth, sustained extended growth for some periods in our four decades history. So what happened during that period? What policies drove that? Were there internal influence? Were there internal influence? What is it that they did in order to get that that we need to replicate? But again, if you still look at those countries, they have not maintained up to 7% continuously. So you see still tapering off in terms of their growth rates. So pulling other countries within the region becomes difficult. We have Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Mozambique experiencing sharp drops in GDP per capita due to conflicts and several other factors that we see on the continent. So these are countries that are very highly resource rich, and then they have big take-ups and sharp falls. So we need to learn from those things as we continue with this study. Next slide, please. So because of this painting that I've tried to shape here, where we have huge resources but failed takeoffs in terms of, on average, Africa breaking and reaching the targets that we want, we then started looking at what are the key challenges we are already picking from that? 
And this is where we want your feedback significantly. Are we missing any that we need to dig deeper into in order to understand so that we will be able to understand what's creating the challenges and find solutions and action plans to be able to change them. Next slide. One of such challenges, next slide. One of such challenges are recurrent crises. But normally we discuss this crisis in the short term. We have COVID-19. Everybody is talking about COVID-19 as if it is the, real, the only problem that Africa has. And we talk about it in the terms of we need resources, we need help, we need this, we need that. I agree. But then if you look at what's going on, every crisis that has happened in economic history always has winners and losers. And the winners and losers are defined by several factors that are consistent across every economic crisis that we've had. In the, po the post-Second World War period that created the economic architecture we have today, we had Europe and America that saw opportunities for trade and continentalization of trade because there were decimation of trade infrastructure and logistics during that period. That's how WTO was born. And these countries that saw these opportunities saw huge benefits from that crisis. So if you look at the post-Second um, World War economic growth in Europe and the United States, they saw huge takeoffs. We have another crisis now. What are we going to do? So for me, I'm making that statement there boldly to say that COVID-19 and other global headwinds is not the problem for Africa's growth. It's actually structural. How we do development, how we approach development, and how we react to crisis. We don't prepare and we, we, don't, le we don't often learn. I'm hoping that this one, we're really learning and we will change the way we do things. And why do I say that? Economic development is driven by three forms of capital. One is natural capital, basically the natural resources we have, and that is actually the real thing that is in any economy we're thinking about. Second is produced capital. All these things we see, but they are produced from nature, from natural capital. And the third one is the means of exchange, financial capital, money which you then use in order to trade the produced capital or transform natural capital to produced capital. Africa is very rich in one of them. The, the third one actually is social capital because the finance is li li linked to the, the produ uh, to the produced capital. So the population that is trading in the market. So we need social capital, we need natural capital, and we need financial capital growing the produced, uh, real economy. And Africa is rich in social capital, where 16% of the global, uh, global population, the most youthful population in the world. And by 2030, 2050, between Africa and Asia will constitute about 80% of the global population. So we're not lacking in that. We have natural capital, as you see here, I call it the commodities con conundrum. Africa has huge, massive potentials in every economic development era that we have looked at. There have been four industrial revolutions that we have seen. The first, the second, and the third were driven by Africa's resources. Now, the, third, the fourth industrial revolution now is technologies. Again, Africa has huge opportunities in that area, and my brother is going to be running an event on digitization, and already in the meetings we have seen how digitization is really the bane for the new economy that we are looking at. What are we going to be doing? Will we wait, sit back, and still be the continent that produces the resources, primary commodities that will support this development, but wait for the produced capital from the rest of the world that will pay for at a factor of 10? The wood that made this in the market maybe has not cost up to 10% of this lectern in terms of in the produced capital. So one of the things we are seeing is that 
all these potentials are good for us, but what will help us is finding technologies, tools, and measures to transform them to produce capital. Because the current economy that we are all living in is driven by produced capital. So let's try and see how we deal with that as we go forward. The second one, next, next slide, we see that we have actually been trading and focusing on an, a, 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 a market it's whose value is declining over time. So there is no, uh, it's not blue sky science to understand why that graph that I showed you was flat. Here, we try to map the real, the nominal and real prices of commodities in global markets, and especially commodities that come from Africa, that Africa trades with the rest of the world. So if you think about cocoa, think about coffee, think about cotton, think about tea, we also did it on oil, uh, crude oil, platinum, cobalt. All these commodities, the real price is going down since 1960. So by selling more and more and rejoicing that you are getting more income, you are actually losing wealth, exporting jobs, exporting your capacity to, pro to, have to participate in the financial markets. So we need to think about how to change our growth driver from commodities to produced capital. Because if you don't add value, markets in economics only pays for value. So if you don't add value, we don't get value. So we need to think about how to transform our natural resources as we go forward. And we, if you go to the next slide, you see the same story in terms of cocoa production, where Africa has over 75% of, co um, of cocoa that's traded in the, in the world. But the value of, um, uh, you know, um, you know co we only sell cocoa beans and account for only 21% of cocoa grinding, simply cocoa grinding. And I mean just grind it. And we sell the cocoa, and others will grind it and produce chocolates. The chocolate market is worth trillions of dollars. So let's think about what we do with the resources that we have. That's a major issue. Crude oil is the next one. Next slide, please. So if you look at this slide, you see exactly the same thing. In each case, you already begin to see why our growth is going up and down, because it's tracking commodity prices in the global markets. And guess what? We don't control the price in that market. We don't define it. So we are a price taker. So this is one of the things that we really need to look at. The next one is copper. Next slide, copper. The time I did this study, I looked at Zambia and South Africa that exports 43% and 21% of total global exports in 2018. But that market they are playing on in is was worth only 12.4 billion US dollars if you sell your raw copper. But between 2017 and 2018 alone, exports of copper ore grew from by 9.7%, uh, 9 which is meaning that particular market was worth about 68 billion US dollars. Just look at the numbers. We are operating in the smaller market, lower value chain, worth 12 billion. We have 48, 43% of that market, so consider how much we got. 43% of 12 billion. But just grinding <laughs> that copper, the market is already transformed to 64 billion. So the people who are getting value from that, that copper is not us. We're actually produce, providing raw materials for the produced capital which the markets pay for. If you actually even go further and look at copper concentrates, the value even goes even higher. I tried to follow the copper to where it goes. And it wasn't economies that are wealthier than we are or that had higher technologies than we are. Chile buys a lot of the, co the, the copper and trades a lot of copper ore. So they're getting value. 
for our resources. Let's think about that. Factor productivity in agriculture is the next one. You always heard we have 65% of uh, arable land left in the world. But our factor productivity of using land to produce the food we eat is the lowest of all regions of the world. So that means we import food. Billions of dollars spent annually to buy food when we have the land to grow the food. And when I was growing up in my village, there were many mango trees along the roads. And I used to think that they were planted. And one day I asked, why are there so many mango trees along the road? People going to, to school, they carry mango for their breakfast, packed lunch. And you eat the mango and throw it on the way when you are going. That's a mango planted. This is Africa. And we're importing food. No way laughing about that. It actually makes me go to bed scared. What are we going to tell God or whoever gave us those resources? Third, major issue. So I've talked about trade. I've talked about natural capital and how we relate in both factors. Third, the next slide is institutional capacity. Here, we try to map institutional capacity, the indicators of institutional capacity in Africa. And you see that there are very low scores. Whether you are talking about public financial management, economic policy management, quality of budget and financial management, or governance, all those factors will score very low. Again, just like Africa's growth pattern, you see it goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down. What is really happening? And if you look further, why we are picking institutions, next slide please, is because institutions everywhere in the world, if you look at institutional economics, it tells you that institutions defines transaction costs. The cost of shipping your cocoa from Cote d'Ivoire to Ghana is defined by the quality of the institutions that controls transport, the logistics, and all those things. And to move, that's why the cost of moving even within the continent is very expensive. It defines the transaction costs. It creates markets. It causes specialization and division of labor, productivity, and economic performance. So without building these institutions, we cannot have the economic performance that we have been already talking about. Next, you look at the behavior of people within the economy the same way. The behavior of organizations, process of creative de de uh, uh, destruction, technology, and everything, institutions define them. So we need to invest heavily in the quality of our institutions. If you look next on that, as, as, and the next slide that's on, on, on there, we compare Africa with the rest of the world. And again, we're on the x-axis. We're investing less than 0.5% of our GDP on research and innovation. So how will we innovate? Other regions are investing 2 3%, and that is how they are rising in their uh, economic development. Next slide. Regional integration and trade is a key thing. I have to rush because of time. And if you also look at the regional integration and trade within the continent, I've already shown you the picture. We're not doing so well. We now have ACFTA. I hope it will not just be policy on paper, that we really focus on trading with each other. This is how economies grow. Next slide is on structural transformation. Because of what I have just shown you, please, next slide. Because of what I've just shown you, we try to look at indicators of structural transformation in Africa since the 1990s. The continent has not changed. We disaggregated it in different countries, and you'll find that some countries in Africa has made some progress. But, not, but a lot more could still be done. So if you look at all these factors, we have 
challenges that we as Africans can address. And it actually depends on us to do so. Of course, next slide, there are other challenges that are exogenous to us that we, can, we need global co cooperation to deal with. One of them being climate change, which we are, we are discussing now, being global insecurity, like the Russia-Ukraine war, and terrorism around the world. All these things change factors of production and logistics in the market. And then geopolitics of development is another major thing that we need to think about, and spillover effects of other global market trends. Because we don't have those five key issues that we have seen that drives development around the world, our economies are very vulnerable to shocks outside our economy. So the dollar appreciates <laughs> because we borrow in dollar denominated, denominated debt. Our debt has increased. You haven't borrowed more, eh? but your debt has increased because you now have to pay higher interest rate. And then debt vulner vulnerability increases because the rate of risk of default increases, and then the cost of debt increases, the cost of capital increases, and then it's just a vicious cycle. So we need to think of how to break out of those issues if we really want to move forward. And to do that, infrastructure is a major issue. Investing in infrastructure, and this is what the African Development Bank focuses on. I'm not going to dwell on it. We know that infrastructure changes factors of production. It increases productivity. But again, the way we invest in infrastructure is key. It has to be productive infrastructure. It's not political infrastructure or even social infrastructure to some extent. So sometimes when we build roads, we need to build roads that lead to markets, to production centers. We need to open up our rural areas to become engines of production and not just build roads only in the cities. So we need to think about all those things as we go forward. The next one, financial flows. Next slide. In two minutes, I'll try and finish. Financial flows, we always talk about this on the continent. Just look at that graph. If you depend on gifts from your friend, you will never get rich. Your friend should only be relevant to help you on emergencies. We help each other when there is an emergency, but it's not that I have to depend in fact, that friendship will stop very soon <laughs> if, that, if that continues. And this is what we see in ODA flows. That's what we see in foreign direct investment flows, portfolio investment flows, all kinds of financial flows is dependent on the goodwill of the other person. How should Africa, with all the resources we have, leave our de development in the hands of others? Next slide. Foreign direct investment, I have shown you. And what that leads to is the next slide where debt becomes a perennial problem on the continent. Please, when you go back, try and look at the fiscal space of your country. Fiscal deficit seems to be synonymous with economic development planning in Africa. Why? Now we're celebrating that, oh, it's, it's improving, it's reduced to 4%. Hey, when are we going to have surplus? And because of all these things, poverty is endemic, social infragility is endemic, and we leave our finance ministers always basically as firefighters in an emergency room, from one crisis to the other, trying to just keep the governments the economy going, struggling every time, and not having the space to think about tomorrow, the productivity, the future, and so on. So how are we going to get the Africa we want? My simple answer is think and act differently. Thank you. So this is. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, 
just to announce that there's a simultaneous in interpretation in English and French. Thank you, Professor. And I will not dilute that message. You heard uh, what the prof said. But one thing, key takeaway, there's no African citizen should go to bed hungry. I always say, I mean, we have the resources, we have the land. We should be planting trees, fruit trees, vegetables. Nobody should go to bed hungry. It's as simple as that. Um, now we have a, a panel discussion. And I would like to request our distinguished panelists to address two questions in just three to five minutes, please. And the questions are, what are the key enablers and barriers to the structural transformation and sustainable growth in Africa that the study should focus on? That's the first question. The second question is, what are the key actions required for African countries to build resilience to external shocks and maintain high growth levels. So, panelists, I'll call upon the Honorable Mrs. Nadia Feta, Minister of Economy and Finance and AFDB Governor for Morocco. And uh, I will request you to speak from your seats, please. Um, the Microphone is there. You have the floor, ma'am. Okay. Well, I'll do it from here. It's okay. They do not see you. <laughs> okay, please. Yes, better. Let them see. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocols uh, respected. Thank you so much, Professor, for, uh, for this presentation. We were expecting two or three additional uh, slides for more optimism, but I'm sure that uh, for the time's sake, you didn't have time, but let's be optimistic for our common future. Uh, regarding the enablers, I think you've, uh, you've covered a lot of them, but maybe just a testimony of what we try uh, to do a, a, in Morocco. We definitely agree that uh, we need to more infrastructure investment. I think we've done much in Morocco in the last 20 years, and today it's having this infrastructure, I would say, assets being more productive. So. Uh, uh, this is why we're busy with having, I would say, a strategy for uh, activities that are fully chosen as priority for the country. Uh, just to leave what, with the presentation of uh, the professor talking about natural resources, I think we've been doing a, a choice in phosphates for years because we were just exporting raw material and being one of the uh, first exporters in Morocco in the world, sorry, but we've been investing heavily in phosphate for uh, having a more valid, uh, added value in all the value chain, uh, from the R&D investments to uh, transformation into fertilizers. And uh, as the professor mentioned, it was about, I would say, uh, having more innovation, but also more partnership, and this is very important partnership with people who have the expertise, who have the technology, but also with the countries who, who need the fertilizers. And I think we're very proud today with this example of phosphate because we are working with our brothers and sisters in Africa trying to produce fertilizers that are needed specifically in that land or the other land. This is one example of how building from a natural capital resources transforming into added value for the group, uh, for the country. Uh, even for agriculture as a sector, we, uh, uh, we st it, is, it still accounts for 15% of, of our GDP, but we are diversifying also this sector. So we've been busy for 10 years with the first strategy 
to be able to, uh, to produce enough products and food. And during the crisis, it was a good, I would say, testimony that we succeeded in, the first, in this first step. But today, with the ambition is different on agriculture. We want uh, uh, to have a, a middle class in the rural world, which means that we need more added value in agribusiness, uh, having tr to transform the products, but also other, have other revenues for people living in the rural world. This is another challenge. The cities are, are growing very fast in, in Africa, but the, the rural world is very important, and we need solutions specifically for what represent almost 50% of the population in our uh, countries, especially in our country. So I think it's about inclusion, inclusion of youth, inclusion of women, having young girls go into school, uh, children go into school, but giving solutions to families for revenues and having this middle class. And this is another example of diversifying economy but taking into account local, uh, local uh, solution. Uh, you said three or five minutes, I think I, I have already done. It was just some example of what we are busy with and which might be a solution for a more sustainable growth and inclusive growth in our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And concrete examples of what can be done and what Morocco is doing. Partnerships, inclusion, massive investment in infrastructure. So the, our next panelist, um, may I now call upon Ms. Hasha Bangari. She's the managing director of the India Exim Bank. And the questions again, what are the key enablers and barriers? What key actions can we take in Africa? Maybe we can learn a thing or two from India. Ma'am, please, you're welcome. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And it's an absolute honor for me to be speaking here. Uh, in fact, I'm just wondering, after Professor Urama gave us such a beautiful presentation covering almost all aspects, I don't know what I'm going to add. So maybe uh, I have a specific... Uh, structured questions, so I'll just take maybe two minutes. And uh, my observations may be from what experience we have derived in India and what we feel could sort of help uh, in, the, uh, in the African continent. So uh, the, the enablers and barriers, uh, when we talk about uh, the three important sectors which also was identified earlier by my speakers is uh, education. So. Education is something which uh, becomes a huge barrier, and we are talking about a very young Africa, so there are many things through edu education we can actually change the whole landscape. Uh, I think uh, based on data, the primary education has improved in Africa, but if we can you know, improve that upon. Now, I just wanted to draw a parallel uh, with what we did in India. In India, we had a nationwide, uh, what we call Sarva Shiksha Abhyan. Basically, what it means is education for all. And there were families who would send their children to work and would not have time to send them to school. So what got added there was uh, to encourage uh, families to send their children for education, they would actually provide uh, meals, lunches, and snacks. And typically, that worked very well in India. When we talk about, uh, we don't talk about big cities, but definitely in the rural areas. And this continues. So I was just wondering if uh, the uh, individual governments can look at this uh, and that there are many sponsors uh, and donors also for these type of programs. So that could help, uh, I thought, uh, for the structural change we are talking about. The other thing very important is, of course, health. So how we ramp up the health uh, uh, infrastructure in the uh, African countries. And there, again, uh, IT has played a very big role. Now, it, IT infrastructure, again, in education, in health, actually facilitates a lot. So whether, you know, now, uh, today, we in India, we are moving a lot to telemedicine. 
we are also talking about uh, med uh, medical tourism because India has that capacity where we are trying and there are many countries and many uh, people who come to India only for medical treatment and it becomes a medical tourism. But uh, if that could be done, I know Africa is a very, very wide continent and it's not going to be so easy. But uh, with the uh, development in the IT space and uh, uh, whether this can sort of be given. Uh, the third one is, of course, energy and power, and that's something which all of us are struggling to find ways with, you know. Now, Africa is blessed with solar, and uh, uh, I think there was some study which said that uh, Africa has 13 times capacity for solar energy than India. Now, in India, of course, with the International Solar Mission, we have our own national solar missions where we are concentrating and we are trying to grow our renewal space. Uh, today also we are dependent on fossil fuel to a large extent, but at least there's a gradual path and understanding to adopt uh, more and more renewable energy. So I feel with the Africa, with this, uh, you know, the blessed solar energy which is already there, whether that can be worked around uh, uh, and can be worked. Now the second point in terms of uh, possible actions required. So I think again I'm going to repeat what has been said, so I'm not going to spend much time. Uh, uh, everybody, the speakers before me have spoken about this commodity-based production. So, as uh, Professor also very rightly uh, demonstrated in her in his presentations, that uh, Africa is more of a commodity producer and exporter, and very volatile. The commodity prices have been very volatile. So, in that case, uh, the 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 fortunes of the continent gets affected. And how do we get to add value and? Uh, you know, then get the benefit, the economic benefit of this rich natural resource which Africa has. A very small example in terms of, say, for example, textile. So, got some statistics in terms of textile. So, uh, Africa produces cotton and exports cotton, but uh, with uh, whether there could be some investment or, in, uh, uh, you know, invitation for FDIs in the textile uh, processing uh, sector, which could then get the benefit also of this uh, uh, cotton uh, uh, which is available in Africa. The other thing is, of course, again, I'm sorry I'm repeating, but leveraging trade agreements, uh, for example, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So how better this can be leveraged to improve and increase the uh, intra-regional uh, trade. So I thought these are some of the points from our side. Uh, and at lastly, and uh, this I, I've just added more to what my economist has given me, uh, is the infrastructure. Uh, for any country to become an international hub, for investment as well as for trade, uh, we need to provide very good infrastructure. But sometimes we also need to understand that the infrastructure has to be desired or needed. So sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes we don't draw that line in terms of what is actually required and what is a huge infrastructure. So I think lots of cons uh, focus on sustainable infrastructure, sustainable from your de from the debt positions of the countries, from the fiscal situations, as well as from the uh, climate change requirements and, and uh, from the uh, demand-driven infrastructure, that is the infrastructure which is actually required. Uh, I think that's, that will sort of pave the stone for uh, better development and uh, improvement of in the international trade and investment. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Bangari. And uh, the common message is infrastructure development, invest in education, ICT. And let me just announce that we are not here to starve you. We did invite you for breakfast, but let's just give an opportunity to our last uh, panelist, Mr. Mamadou Biteye, the Executive Secretary of the African Capacity Building Foundation. The questions are the same. Please, sir, uh, you have the floor. So we'll have breakfast as soon as he's done. So please come through. You are the one who's standing between. between yes. We'll be very please. brief. Thank you. Three minutes, five minutes. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, uh, for the brilliant presentation and also to uh, speakers that went before me. I will try to summarize in uh, a couple of points in terms of the determinants. Um, First of all, I think that it is very important. We can have plans, ambitions, 
But there is a famous saying uh, in Spanish that says, entre dicho y hecho hay un trecho, which means between saying something and actually doing it, there is a big gap. And between actually the ambitions and the concrete results on the ground that can be felt, experienced by our citizens, that big difference is capacity to implement. Uh, where I'm going with this is actually uh, I wanted to double click on the, the human capital, which is extremely important, and not only for today, but also for the future in a rapidly changing world. That's one thing, and that means so many things, uh, whether it is in terms of education reform to make it much more uh, adapted and relevant to our current needs? How do we build technical level capacities? All our children, we look at them to go for tertiary education. That's not the only thing we need. We need qualified technical professionals if we are going to drive industrialization and basic things. And we, the list can, can go on. Second thing I want to highlight, and you mentioned resilience. It is also how do we protect economic gains? What would make an African country that I will not name today make extraordinary strides in agricultural production, reach even food self-sufficiency, and by the next shortages of rain, it's experiencing food crisis. How do we address that? What is it that we, in this study, I would like to see with those ambitions of having sustained economic growth over several decades, how do we make sure that we are not losing the hardly fought for economic growth gains by the next shock? Uh, 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 third, I think that we need also to look at how we can leverage today digital. Uh, the past three years, uh, or the two and a half years, you know, since COVID, what have we seen in the world? We have seen three years of digital digitization happen in just one year. This is extremely important for us to take stock of. Second, a study by World Economic Forum late last year published, says that 70% of wealth that will be created in the next 10 years will be through digital platforms. This is important for Africa not to be left behind. And uh, I will just share a few data points. Uh, last year, uh, we can look at uh, uh, personal or household uh, consumer expenditure in Africa. $1.93 trillion, 91% of which is cash. That shows how behind we are. Another data point just looking at that is today, you have in Africa 1.4 billion people. Compare with Sweden, about 10 million popul population. You will see that the number of digital transactions in Sweden, 10 million people, equals the number of digital transactions in Africa, 1.4 billion people. If we are not resolving those problems and riding on the wave of digitization to power 
intra-community trade and our trade between us and others in an efficient way, uh, I think that it will be uh, a bit difficult. And last point I will make, because there are many we can make in determinants. One of the ways of protecting our gains is not just about resilience. It's also about efficiency. Agriculture, we know, is the big economic engine for all of our countries and a priority place. But we all know that 30% of everything we produce on this continent when it comes to grains is lost to, due to inefficiencies. When you talk about fruits and vegetables, it's 40%, goes sometimes up to 50%, still due to inefficiencies. Please tell me, which company can prosper if you are losing systematically one third of your production or half of your production? Those are key issues I think that this study will have to look at. Thank you. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Those are very pertinent issues that you raised there. We will now go into a question and answer session. But before that, may I ask you to please get some breakfast. Uh, we are feeding Africa now. <laughs> uh, the high table, please, you can lead the way. Then we'll go into the Q&A. Or maybe we, OK. So maybe because of uh, time, um, and I know that our executive directors and others have some statutory meetings to go to by 10, um, so we can continue the discussion, but people are welcome to go grab your breakfast and continue um, this. So I think that will be the best, so that we can achieve the purpose of coming here, which is to hear from you, um, your perspectives and the things that we need to, we have not really thought about that we need to think about as we go forward. So, sorry to take over. <laughs> yeah, so please, we can go get breakfast and then people who have questions can still continue and we continue to do that because we have 20 minutes to finish. Okay, thank you very much. Robin, my Friends, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Amatia Kashaija. I'm the Minister for Finance, Planning and Development in the Republic of Uganda. The issue we are discussing here is so fundamental that you need maybe two, three days to dig it, to look at all the aspects. By the way, we have handled it. No, 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 no. We will not be able to get a solution that we can all go and follow. Therefore, I'm suggesting the bank, sometime this year, they should organize a symposium of all the ministers of finance of Africa. We come and spend a number of days chewing this problem and making concrete resolutions and setting out targets so that at the end of that conversation, everybody will know which direction to take and there should be a monitor. The bank should be monitoring us. Uganda, how far are you going on this? Me, I believe that's when we'll be able to get the real solution of the problem that we are speaking about today. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Af African Day. My name is Joata Mensah with the 
DCA, but I'm here in my personal capacity. But what I want to say is that central to this uh, growth issue, I agree that 7% to me will not cut it. It should be double digit. And if you look at the trends in China, it was beyond 10% growth. So 7% would not do it. But where I want to central my discussion on growth, and I hope the paper uh, or the project will concentrate on, is regional integration, regional integration, regional integration is stupid. And why do I say that? Regional integration because in, in order to sustain growth, we need specialization, comparative advantage. Some countries have some comparative advantage in terms of resources. And we know that common trade tells us that that is what we need to do in order for specialization. So that's key for the growth. Number two, key for growth is also education. Are we going to think of, in terms of innovations, are we going to think of STEM, which is science, technology, education, uh, sorry, uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics? This is where you drive your uh, innovations from. This is where you drive your productivity from. And so therefore, embedded in that is the technology we're talking about. So number two, for this growth, we need to concentrate on STEM and innovation. Number three, for this growth, we need to also talk about the fact that you need to enhance productivity. And to enhance productivity, that ties it into the question of infrastructure. And that ties it into the question of free movement of people, right? Which would require us to remove those barriers. It doesn't make sense why Africans can travel freely within the continent without an, uh, 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 why requiring a visa. So Mr. Commissioner, the passport, the passport, the passport. So the fourth part, thing I would like to talk about is also the question of when we talk about resilience, we always say countries should become resilient. But you cannot be a small country like where I am, my country, Ghana. I don't know how it can be resilient to external shocks. The only way we can be robust enough to extend and to be able to withhold external shocks is regional integration as a continent, as a continent collectively together with the economy strong and we do away with fragmented markets, and we have one common market agenda, I think that is what would make it become more resilient to shocks. Otherwise, we keep talking about this resilience as a country, as Burkina Faso, as South Africa, big, big as it is, I don't think it can be resilient to external shocks. So collectively, that is what we need. And the last point I want to say is how would we pay for all this? for our, our development. And that comes into domestic resource mobilization. We can't continue to think that the World Bank will bail us out. We can't continue to think that the IMF will bail us out. We have having strong discussions on this SDRs and all that. And what we are doing is let's recycle SDRs, let's ask for more SDRs. It's just going to sink, put us in the hole. We're going to get more debt. But the way we could do it for ourselves is how collectively we have the resources. Collectively as Africa, we have more reserves compared to India or Turkey. But we all, the health of states, 54 as it is, parade to these places as if we do not have. I'm sorry that I have to be honest. I don't know whether I'll be fired. But, but, but I, 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 think, I think this is what we need to do. This is what collectively, and that ties it into the IFF, right? Until we block this tax expenditure, tax incentives, the mispricing of our, uh, of our commodities, we're going to lose, as Tabi, uh, President Mbeki said, 83 billion every year out of the continent. So I think collectively, I would say that growth can be achieved if we come together as one, as Africa. Africa must unite. I thank you. Happy Africa Day. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joe Atamensa. Honesty is what we require if we are going to achieve the growth levels we are talking about. Anybody else who wants to take the floor? Minister, please. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and let me start by addressing to all of you happy Africa Day. I want, first of all, to sincerely thank Professor 
for his uh, insightful presentation. Uh, definitely, it gave us the state of uh, our countries, our continent, the challenges that we have to face. And certainly, and this is what I would like to add, as uh, my sister from uh, Morocco mentioned, the future is uh, bright for the continent. We should believe in it, but we should work hard to make it happen. The challenges presented uh, are certainly extensive and exhaustive. But some uh, previous speaker made it also clear. Human capital should be at the center of uh, our policies. All these uh, key areas, if uh, we expect to make progress on them, we need high quality human capital. Therefore, I want to suggest that this part of your study should be strengthened. And equally, as it was also said before, we should come together, Minister of Finance, Minister of Economy, Regional Integration, to sit, reflect, discuss, not only one day, but probably two days. And at the end of the day, we should have very strong takeaways. And uh, of course, you mentioned, Professor, we have some uh, key strategic vision at the level of our different institutions and countries. African Union, African Development Bank, the United Nations, and our separate countries. We need to align all these policies. We need to align all this vision. One point I would like to touch, which is uh, certainly uh, also based on uh, what we experienced at the beginning of uh, the 60s. Our trade with the rest of the world was based on export financing, export of raw material financing. Now we are talking about structural transformation of our economy. One of the key pillars of the high five is industrialization. If you want to industrialize, you have to invest massively, you have to finance massively. This is the reason why we expect, we hope, and we want our bank to be a very strong bank to finance our development. We need resources. You cannot build infrastructure. You cannot feed Africa. You cannot light up Africa. You cannot integrate without sufficient financial resources to build all this uh, infrastructure. Therefore, deficit, I believe, Professor, should not be the main uh, attention point. What do we do with the deficit? This is the key aspect. If we use deficit just to finance social infrastructures, which is not going to be able to produce, generate the revenue for the reimbursement, then we are not doing good. But if you use the deficit to accelerate the equipment of our continent with infrastructure that are going to improve on the productivity, then we are doing good with our deficit. It is not a panacea for sure. We need to attract more foreign direct investment. We need to improve on the business environment. I do hope that uh, with this uh, study again, we'll have a set of uh, solution, recommendation, proposals that are going to help us accelerate the development of our continent. I signed two weeks ago with India Exim Bank, a financing agreement to implement an electricity network of 230 kilometers to transport electricity from production area to industrialized area for implementing industries. This is what we want to do, and we believe our bank is capable of doing that. On the policy level, our head of state have demonstrated their commitment for integration of the continent. This is going to be the market for the future, and we are very, very, very positive and optimistic about this bright future. Even if we are not probably part of the story at that time, we believe our children or our grandchildren will uh, probably take advantage of this beautiful continent. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Your Excellency Commissioner Prof, you have the support of the ministers. You have heard calls 
they want to discuss this further. Um, anybody else to take the floor? Commissioner, please. I think you can now do the closing remarks and respond. Yes. I think the first thing is to thank each and every one of you for coming to be with us here. And also thank you for your contributions. My colleagues have been taking down notes, and I'm not going to summarize. But there was a lot of emphasis on industrialization. And I'm looking directly at my brother here from the African Building Capacity Foundation. And he's seated next to the bag of money. <laughs> so the challenge I make to you publicly develop a concept paper on the establishment of an African Manufacturing Institute so that we have a cadre of manufacturers who can come up with the uniquely African manufactured goods and will be adding value. I heard from the ministers the minister from Uganda, the minister from Cameroon. We need more time. My colleagues are here. Rumbi is listening, and Denaya is busy. We are meeting in Lusaka for a meeting of the Specialized Technical Committee of Ministers of Finance, Monetary Affairs, Economic planning and integration. The dates are 18 to 20 or to 22. What we can do, you work with our colleagues in Alzababa. A day before the ministers meet, let us dedicate a full day on this issue. My brother there is going to make the presentation, Professor Kevin Urama. And I'll write to the Minister of Finance of Zambia to say, we are going to finish the meeting on the 23rd. But the first day of the ministerial meeting is going to be dedicated on this issue so that we address it fully. And I'll conclude by saying that it has been positive throughout. Last time we had our meeting, which was virtual. One of the professors of economics he told us very, very frankly, you are too ambitious, you cannot do it. You don't have the capacity to generate 70 to 10% economic growth. So continue what you are doing. We shall not continue what we are doing. We ignore the professorial advice. Sometimes the professors are wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Just to. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. <laughs> Commissioner Muchanga, it's always uh, inspiring to hear you speak on African issues. As we know, this was a hybrid event, so there have been some people also uh, chiming in from France, from the US, and others. And I just want to read one of the uh, comments that I received. The name is Max Garrett. I think it's in Paris. And it says, no more talk. Now it's time for action. Implementation, implementation, implementation. Max, we hear you. And then in that regard, I just also want to draw our attention to some of these brochures that you have um, um, is out here. Because the bank, your bank, is a bank of action, a bank of implementation. So once we started identifying these challenges and issues, we started developing instruments within the bank to have them implemented 
to allow the bank to be positioned to implement them. So the first one is capacity development strategy for Africa. So please pick it up and look at it. We worked with ACBF, the Africa Capacity Building Foundation, and we consulted like 200 African institutions and global institutions working on Africa to come up with this strategy. Let's make it happen together. The other one is the strategy for economic governance in Africa, addressing the institutional governance issues which we have just identified as a major challenge. My friend, my brother, Di uh, Director Abdullahi Kulebali, who is handling this work with us, is here. So you can also talk with him to get further details. But let's also look at this and see how we move with it. We've talked about debt. So the bank responded with a multi-dimensional action plan for addressing debt vulnerability in Africa. And that action plan is already in motion in some of our countries that are already in debt distress and others that are highly vulnerable to debt issues on the continent. And one of that action of the uh, multidimensional action plan is establishing a public finance management academy for Africa. So that public finance management academy will help to address the bottlenecks we see in domestic revenue mobilization. My brother uh, from ATAF was sitting here. We worked with them and we are working with them on that. We are working with IMF, World Bank, and the rest of them to come up with ways of helping build that capacity on our continent to be able to plug the holes in our public finance management systems. We always talk about financial flows but we always think of the inflows, the financial outflows from this continent in real terms is humongous. The figures we have from Ongtad and others is talking about 86 billion, that's about 3.7% of our GDP being lost every year. But that is still a tip of the iceberg. If we look at the mines, look at agriculture, look at trade misinvoicing and all the things that is happening on the continent, you will see that Africa can finance its develop development. If you want to hear more about that, my sister, uh, Vanessa Ushi, who is the director, acting director for Natural um, Resources Management and Investment Center of the bank, is there, and she can talk to you a lot more about what's happening with our natural resources. Then we've talked about knowledge, STEM, science, technology, and innovation, and so on. The bank has developed, just recently approved by our board of directors, um, a knowledge management strategy for Africa. So how to really rapidly increase investments in these key sectors in education, not only to produce technical papers, but to translate those technical papers to productive investments for the continent is here. And then finally, we take accountability seriously. The bank is an accountable bank. So we have produced, uh, we are working now to produce an African public service delivery index for Africa. We've checked with across the, 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 the globe and we don't find a tool that can be used to hold public servants accountable. In terms of what you are saying, the bank, African Union, and African citizens holding us as their public servants accountable for the things we do, what we do with their taxpayer uh, money. So how are we delivering on energy? How are we delivering on GDP growth? How are we delivering on water services? How are we delivering on poverty? How are we delivering on most of several key indicators that are there? So my colleague, Dr. Njeri Wabiri, uh, is not here, that's working on it, can give you a little bit further details on this. So our plan is that once we are able to um, have a standardized, generally accepted index, we can then work with the AU, uh, the peer review mechanism, and so on, to even afford prizes, um, prize annual public service delivery index awards to create incentives 
recognize those who are doing well, learn from what they're doing so that we can try to replicate it going forward. And that will be at the continental level, at the regional level, and at the national level as well. So with all these efforts led by our president, President Akin Umiya Deshina, and the leadership and collaboration we're having with the African Union and African institutions seated here. My brother here is working with us on the Public Finance Management Academy. And we have started the first um, training of a cohort of 140 African public servants nominated by yourselves, the ministries of finance. And we'll be working with them not just to have a workshop and say we have trained you, no. We take you through 18 month structured training, just like you're having a postgraduate studies, diploma, or master's degree on public service, uh, on public um, finance management across all the cycles on public finance management. And we deploy the skills and competencies of African institutions, CABRI, ATAF, ACBF, AERC, working side by side with the, a with the uh, uh, IMF. Uh, World Bank, uh, Brookings Institution, and all the institutions, Harvard, and so on, that we can get. Let's all sit at table and craft solutions for Africa's challenges. Because for me, helping Africa come, up, out, come out of poverty is a sustainability imperative for the world. So this is not philanthropy. It's not development aid. It's actually saving our common future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Urama. Thank you, Commissioner. Sorry, sorry, I was just being reminded something okay. <laughs> by my team. Please just have a look at the slide there because it has some our basically marshalling words in terms of how we want to do this study and work. We have challenges. In the middle of difficulties lies opportunities. So where you show me the challenge, I look for the opportunity. This is how innovation functions. So thank you, Honorable Ministers, reminding us that we need to focus on the positive side. So all these are challenges, but without them, we won't have this transformative opportunity of our lifetime to do something differently. That was from Albert Einstein. Now, the next one is that we cannot use the old map to explore the new world. I'm an economist, but I need to think of my economic tools for solving social problems today. I always sit back and I think, we had Alfred Marshall, John Maynard Keynes, and all these brilliant people who sat down and thought about social challenges in their economy, in their world that they lived in, and created models on how to solve them. Models are just extractions from reality. So they extracted from their reality on how to solve them. So I kept asking myself when I was in undergraduate studies, why do I have to understand their model instead of create mine? Because I'm not living in their world, and their society is not mine. And even if I was living in their society, their society has moved on, because everything is dynamic and change is constant. So let's think about applying everything we know to our current circumstances innovatively. Finally, no social problem can be solved or even eradicated without distribution or redistribution of economic, political, and social resources. So we shouldn't hold on to where we are. I am in the African Development Bank Group and I have this position, so you do what I say. I am the minister, so you do what I say. Let us sit together at table, share that power that you have, that resource that you have, that knowledge that you have. Perhaps two is always better than one. Thank you.
Thank you very much for attending. Thank you to our online audience. Can we please have a group picture? Group picture, please, before we go for breakfast. <laughs> group. Yes. Yes, please. Can we please have a picture of the panelists and ministers? Yes, thank you. And the, and the ministers, please. Panelists, ministers, executive directors, country delegations, please, can we have just a family photo, please? ED Chapter 2. Please, can we have a family photo and we go for the breakfast? I don't know where to have it. This can be here still. Ah, well done. Thank you. Can this go? Yes, it can. Is there a place there we can have it?